many people interested in what I had to say all at the same time and the recordings. So this is a Anyway, so I'm Julie Percival. Um, I am not an IT geek, but I am a statistical geek. I have a PhD from, public, uh, from the University of Texas at Dallas in public policy and political economy. For those of you who are kind of, who think that's really impressive, it's just economics with a public policy focus. And so they use a lot of weird econometric methods. And it's uh, kind of an odd story how I came to this particular topic. Um, so I was in graduate school and I was taking an institutions and society class. And so this is a big part of our degree is we, um, we do a lot of research into um, very particular areas of public policy. And some people will go into government and to evaluating programs and policy. And one of the things that you need to know is how institutions work and why they work. And a lot of the really nitty gritty details about them. And um, while I was taking this class, um, I was um, dating um, Ray Percival here. And um, I, there was, I don't remember exactly what was going on at the time, but there was some big to do with IPv4 and IPv6. And one evening when we were talking about, oh, whatever talk, we were the topic of discussion, I, it came up and I asked Ray, oh, what is IPv4? I mean, what is an internet protocol? And um, he proceeded to go into about a three-hour lecture um, <laughs> about, you know, what an IP address was. And, you know, if you're really interested in more about it, you know, here, here are the places you can do more research. And I thought, and after hearing about some of the details of how this came about, I got really interested in the institutions themselves. And um, then about a year ap after that, in another graduate class, I guess a, a paper came out of that, which, you know, that eventually became another talk that I did at um, Nanog a couple of years ago. Um, and if you Google me, that might actually come up with my name um, in, on um, IP allocation uh, protocols. And um, so, yeah, and I was in another class about a year later, and we were talking about behavioral norms in scientific culture. And one of the first books that we read um, had to do with Robert Merton. And he wrote an essay out of a law, series of essays called The Normative Structure of Science. And this was essentially the foundation of the sociology of science. And I know probably a few of you have some history of science backgrounds, so you may have heard of Robert Merton before. Um, and you may be familiar with the behavioral norms in scientific culture. Um, universalism, disinterestedness, organized skepticism, and communalism. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of these, these things and how they're related to internet infrastructure culture. Um, and like I said, I, was, I, I took a second graduate class in the history of science and science and culture. And we were reading about this. And of course, again, I said, oh, well, these norms are really interesting. And I actually see a lot of these in IT infrastructure culture. And when I say IT infrastructure, I want to be really clear. I'm not talking about internet culture. I'm not talking about hacker culture in particular. I'm talking about the culture of the people who build and run the internet. Uh, this is you know, a little more specific group because these are people who are involved in maintaining the structure of the internet as we know it. And a lot of people who don't work in your industry have very weird ideas about how things happen. And it's mostly just magic. But to you, it's a lot of really hard, backbreaking work. And um, I don't think people appreciate it nearly as much as they should. So this first uh, norm that Robert Merton elaborated was universalism. Now, when I try to describe universalism in one word to people, I like to bring up uh, Disney's movie Ratatouille. Now, have any of you seen this movie? 
Okay, yeah, some of you have kids and you've seen it repeatedly, um, as I have. And it's a lovely movie and you know, the first time I saw it, oh, I absolutely cried. One of the interesting morals that comes out of that movie was that there's a difference between these two statements that anyone can cook and a cook can come from anywhere. That is, in essence, the idea of universalism, is that anybody can contribute, not just anybody can contribute to science, but that a good scientist can come from anywhere and look like anything, and that you shouldn't necessarily judge someone's value on those particular individual attributes. Um, Robert Merton also brought up some examples of things that were the opposites of these behavioral norms. And in the um, instance of universalism, um, it's more tribal nature. It's not uh, looking outside of your group for anything different or new people. You only want to stay with people that you know. Uh, this is a really important norm in science because if you're only looking or you're only reaching to the people in your immediate area, you're not getting a really good sample of ideas from different cultures and from different perspectives and from people with different talents. Um, and it's not a really good way to produce good science. So he said, scientists can come from anywhere. Um, the second norm that I'm going to talk about here is disinterestedness. So disinterestedness is, well, actually, a better example for disinterestedness is kind of the converse. Um, so do any of you have kids here? Have any of you had your kids vaccinated? And you've heard of Andrew Wakefield. <laughs> so, he's a really good example of the counter norm for disinterestedness. He was found to have um, competing interests in a single dose vaccine that he was doing research for and he, has, he was doing research on multi-disease uh, vaccines and found that they may cause autism which they found out later, not only was that not true, that he had faked the results. Uh, so <laughs> he violated several uh, uh, norms within the community. Um, but disinterestedness is just the idea that you aren't necessarily gonna have a material gain in the results of your research. You wanna be objective. Um, the third uh, behavioral norm is organized skepticism. Now, <laughs> this is one that I really, um, when I was reading about it, I thought immediately about the IT community because everything is approached with the, con with the idea that um, your answer may not be the right one and that everybody's idea or potential explanation for what brought the network down is possibly <laughs> wrong. So. Um, but it's not just individuals being skeptical on their own. It's the entire community coming together and agreeing that they're all going to be skeptical about each other's ideas and not get mad about it because that's what you do. Um, a, and obviously the counter norm and the opposite of this would be dogmatic behavior and accepting exactly what people around you are telling you to be true. You're like, oh, that's the way it's always been. That never happens. And, well, it's not the thing that should happen in the industry. The fourth behavioral norm uh, that I'm gonna talk about today is communalism. Now, when, if you go back and read Robert Merton's original article, it's worded a little bit differently. Um, but after the Red Scare, uh, they decided that maybe they won't call it communism, but they'll call it communalism. So um, if you ever get the chance to read any of his work, and I highly recommend it, it's really interesting stuff, that's just substitute one for the other. But it's not necessarily that it's a forced sharing, it's just that you, when you have an idea or you have research, 
that you publish that research and that you let other people know about it because that's the only way that science is going to advance. The counter norm to this is obviously secrecy and proprietary behavior. So what does that have to do with IT infrastructure uh, <laughs> group? Um, you guys don't always really like apply things the way other people do. Um, and so while a lot of these norms I found were present in the community, you don't always interpret them the same way as scientists do. And you kind of do some unexpected things with them. <laughs> so um, I just want to take a moment also to remind you, these norms are ideals. They aren't things that you should take literally, um, but they're things that people strive for that they think are regular behaviors. And a lot of times, you don't even think about them. I mean, they're just kind of in the background of, well, you know, why is it that people get so upset about certain types of licensing, for example? Um, well, because, you know, some people believe that one of them adheres more, better, I'm sorry, to better to one community, one of these behavioral norms or another. Um, let's see. So, in the IT industry, so, um, I should also mention, I'm writing a book about this, and one of the, so there are essentially four areas where I was looking at how these behavioral norms show themselves in IT infrastructure community. So one of them is in the people themselves and who you hold in esteem. Um, institutionals, institutions and institutional behavior and expectations, the actual physical architecture of the internet and the protocols. Um, and after I talk about those, I would like to go into some more details about what kinds of things are kind of unique norms to this community that I've observed. And I hope that will at least provide some amount of amusement. Um, so, how do we know who to trust? I mean, that's a really important issue. I mean, not just from a matter of programming perspective or from security certificates. How do you know in the community who is somebody that you hold in high regard? Um, so I'd like to kind of go out to you guys now and say, so who are some examples of people in your community that you hold in high regard that you trust? Somebody who's a role model. Michael. I, I don't want to say Kurt McCusick. Yeah. But he's, even he is trust but, trust but verify. Right. Right. OK. He's held in high regard. Yes. Yes. So I mean, it's not somebody that you're necessarily, like, you believe everything that they do. But there's something that they do that you hold them and you look to them as a, as a, a role model. Um, so those are some good examples. Um, so let's see. Um, so, oh, also, so who are some people that you don't necessarily hold in high regard? Yeah, that guy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see some fingers pointing. Very interesting. That's curious. So it's really kind of hard. Sorry, go ahead. Oh my gosh. So it is really kind of hard to get an idea of who is held in high regard or esteem in the community. So I thought, oh God, I got to find some way to objectively measure this. Um, so I went to the ISOC site and um, I ran through all the people that they listed as their Hall of Fame inductees and I thought, well, if anything, that's an indicator of somebody who's held in high esteem in the community, whose, whose values and behavior and efforts to work in the community um, are valued. So, and this is a... Um, I think this was a couple years ago, so the, the data may be a little bit di different now, but as you can see, it seems pretty clear that there's a trend. Um, 
that you're seeing a lot of academic people who work in the academic field. Yes, Peter. Uh, we don't necessarily hold ISOC in high regard. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. But, I mean, but if you go to the hall, of, actually, I mean, I looked through them and some of them seem like they're kind of badass, so. But one of the points that I want to make through this is that the, the people who created and did a lot of the foundational work on internet infrastructure, they came out of academia and they hold academic moral behavioral standards. So they really are vested in Merton's norms. And um, something I feel like I should mention as well is, so I went to an Aaron meeting fairly recently as uh, a fellow, and I got the opportunity to meet Vince Cerf. And I was talking to him about this in particular. I said, you know, it's really interesting that there are so many people who are, who came out of the academia, who are from the, the core of people who are in IT infrastructure, you know, I bet they hold the same behavioral norms. And he's like, oh, well, yeah, like a lot of the, the institutions that we created were deliberately based on a lot of these things. So I thought that was uh, really interesting. Oh, wait, hi, Peter. So there's another way of determining whether people are held in high regard, and that's some very crass physical attributes. Um, I'm sure some of you know somebody with an epic competency beard. So it, that's, that's just one way of telling, some, uh, telling that somebody's valued in the community, or rather valued by their employer so much that they're not going to fire them for whatever they do. <laughs> As long as they're doing their job, you can get away with a lot of stuff. Uh, yes, that's the problem, because women can't have beards. So what do we do? We have competency hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> so yeah, and I, I actually asked her for permission, unlike Peter. <laughs> so. Oh, a color, yeah, that would be, that would be interesting, a color beard. I don't know who he is, but I respect <laughs> <laughs> So that's just one of the interesting ways that I found that people will look for certain markers of esteem within the community or whether they're valued. So um, that, guys, that doesn't mean go out and grow an epically long beard, you know, especially just talk to your, you know, spouse beforehand if that's a good idea, because they usually care about that. I'm, I'm compelled to point out Exhibit A right here. <laughs> yes. Darcy, your uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we all trust you. Epic competency yeah. beard. Darcy, just run with it. It's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Darcy, hold oh. this in the <laughs> <laughs> A competency beard. I, I, was, I was just remarking yesterday that you know, they've got all these strange looking characters running around here, many with beards and many with knapsacks. Why isn't there SWAT teams all over the place? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the social norms uh, of a particular community aren't going to necessarily match up with those of the general society. And that's, uh, that's another interesting observation. Thank you. Um, so the second thing that I looked at in kind of evaluating how uh, Merton's norms kind of pop up here and there, is in the institutions and policy making structures um, in your industry. So ICANN, IANA, your regional area uh, registries, um, the FreeBSD organization, they apply a lot of these principles, particularly, I felt, uh, disinterestedness as universalism, because they really go out of their way to reach out to diverse communities to try to get their opinion. Um, I know there may be some disagreement with that. Um, but like I said, these are, these are norms, these are your expectations for their behavior. And that's why you're mad when they're not fulfilling that promise. 
so but they also but they but like I said you know they do apply certain things like they worked on the multi-stakeholder approach to representation which I kind of find as a political scientist um, I find that really fascinating because anybody who wants to have a voice in the process or who says that they have an interest in the process can have a say in the process. I can go to the Aaron or the RIPE meetings and I can speak up. I don't actually like own any IP addresses. I don't run any data centers. But I can go and I can go up to the mics and I can still say my piece. Even if it's completely outrageous and doesn't make any sense. And trust me, when I went to the Aaron meeting, there were definitely a few of those. So, I felt very empowered to go up and speak my piece if I really felt like it was necessary. Um, they're independent organizations. Uh, they're non-governmental. Um, but within them, they have this, uh, they have elected and appointed people who serve on these committees. It gives a good mix of people who actually have experience in the industry and people they feel like really should have a voice or have a, um, um, have an opinion that needs to be heard. Um, they are expected, and it's normal for people dis to disclose their conflicts of interest. And uh, I remember at the Aaron meeting, there was a big to do about somebody who hadn't disclosed something or a or connection to a company. And they were like, no, 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 I mentioned it in this place and this place. This is not a secret. And so I found that that was really interesting. And I do see it in other places, too, that it's kind of expected that you're going to have conflicts of interest. I mean, it's not a perfect world, and nobody's perfectly objective. We, I mean, you've got to pay the bills somehow. And you've got to work for someone. But as long as you're being open and upfront about what your conflict of interest is, that's a good thing. So I feel like it really applies the principle of disinterestedness very well. Um, the architecture itself, end-to-end, -end, oh god, I love end-to-end. -end. Um, this is one, I had a, a really difficult time with this concept at first, and then I had to go back and I had to read the whole history of it, and you know, wh where end-to-end -end came from and how it was designed, and the more I read about it, the more I fell in love with the concept of just how perfectly it illustrated Mertonian norms in the industry. It's, it's essentially universal. I mean, everything's considered valid. Um, you don't necessarily prefer types of traffic over the of others, um, with some exceptions to um, some laws that might be in progress in the US, which I have no opinion about <laughs> as a US government employee. Um, but I'm sure some of you may have some very strong opinions about that. Um, you don't necessarily trust your connections to be valid. It's skeptical. It's inherently skeptical of what's going on around it. It's always checking and rechecking. Um, and it allows for, I mean, just inherently, the internet allows for sharing of all the resources on that network. Well, that you have permission to have. Um, and I think, so this is the part where I think you guys are going to have probably the most interest, this being you know, a um, BSD conference, and you're really vested in the idea of open source. And um, in my research into open source, so you've got obviously proprietary software and you've got open source software, but within open licensing, there's a wide spectrum of different types of licenses and what's considered to be open or free or net or so these kind of run the gamut from being restrictive to permissive um, and when I say restrictive it's not necessarily something that's bad it's just that it has more conditions that are added on to it and it makes it a little more complex for the user um, who's trying to um, use something from one license to another. So, but the licensing arguments that I've found really illustrate how dedicated the community is to these Mertonian norms of communalism, universalism, organized skepticism, and disinterestedness. And um, 
we can talk about this probably all day long and you can come to the bar tonight or to the hacking lounge and you can talk to me all night about this topic because this is a really interesting topic in particular for me and I'm sure a lot of you have very wide-ranging opinions about what exactly is open um, but I think that those very conversations that occur in this community about what is open really illustrates how dedicated you are to the idea of communalism in this instance. Um, the request for comment series, so this is another protocol that really is, I figure it's the purest expression of communalism and, oh, sorry, all four of these Mertonian norms. Um, and the, so the process itself is this giant gladiator pit of ideas where you just throw in them and it out comes you know stuff that has to go to comment to the entire community I mean nothing in the academic culture is like this I mean while stuff is susceptible not susceptible subject to peer review in academic culture we don't send it out to the public and ask everybody to comment on our economic articles. I mean, it goes to NBER, and you know, there's a few people who read it here and there, and they'll do, well, you, maybe you should change this about it. It's not necessarily something that goes out into public before it's published. And so I really like the RFC series because it's like peer review on steroids. Um, it is one of the most <laughs> pure expressions of organized skepticism that I've seen. And I really, really like how well, not that you just, that it's something that you all use together. And that when people try to, you know, insert certain things into it that are just in the self-interest of one particular community, <clears throat> um, Sure, there are a few examples of those who, uh, who tried to insert very particular protocol, Ray's smiling because he knows which one I'm referring to, but I didn't put in my notes so I don't remember who it is. Um, so that when uh, individuals who try to promote their own self-interest for things that go into the RFCs, a lot of times people just don't use them because they don't apply to everyone. So um, I think the RFCs are inherently really uh, a really strong protocol and something that really represents these norms. Um, so let's see. Um, how am I doing on time? OK, um, we're good. So the norms that I found were kind of unique to IT infrastructure culture. Now, it's, yes, you're going to recognize a few of these. I didn't put John Paul still in the last one, but yes. Um, so one of the things that I found about um, institutional strength when I was taking my institutions and society class is that something that really makes for strong communities and strong institutions are common goals. And you all have one of the biggest common goals between you, which is keeping the network up in whatever way, shape, or form that occurs. It has to stay up. And this is something that creates successful organizations. Um, if you've read any um, Eleanor Ostrom and the principles of institutional design for self-governed uh, organizations, um, she talks at length about this. I think there are seven principles. I would have to go back and look through the chapters. Um, and this is the first thing she mentions, is that all successful self-organized groups have a common goal. And usually it's the conservation of something, it's the preservation of fishing rights, it's to maintain a communal resource. Um, one of the ways that you achieve this goal is through routing around the damage. Now, you know, at first when I heard this particular uh, turn of phrase, 
I thought, oh, that's interesting. I guess that's really useful for actual, like, you know, physical networking thing. I mean, that's the whole concept between the distributed network system, which is that if there's any damage that occurs in the network, you just route around it. And it makes it something that's really stable, and it makes it something that continues to function in spite of, you know, damage to it. But you don't apply this just to the network, you apply it to your personal lives too. Um, I've heard stories about uh, individuals <coughs> in IT who, um, when encountering certain kinds of bureaucratic or systemic um, objections to whatever they wanted to do, they just routed around the damage. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with this principle in just your work life. Now, this, I think that this is a good concept that can be applied to business culture as well. And a, a lot of times, that's just how you need to get work done. But I mean, you're almost explicit about it. You don't, you don't stop and wait for, you know, if you got to keep the network up. So if you don't <laughs> work around the system where there are objections or problems, um, you're not going to be able to maintain that common goal. Um, and that really drives it. Um, when I first read about John Postel, I thought, oh my gosh, what a behemoth of a man. I mean, he does everything. Um, the father of the internet. Um, and he had a lot of interesting things to say, but this one was possibly the one that I see again and again, the one that really occurs most within the community. And to be cautious in what you send, generous in what you accept. It's not just a good principle for engineering, it's a good principle for life. And the the idea that, and I feel like th this is kind of an outgrowth of the universalism principle and it kind of operationalizes it. Um, because you want to be really generous about, you know, who you're thinking about taking ideas from. But you should be cautious about things that you say and how you say them. Um, and I see this come up again and again in the culture about, how, how important it is to be very cautious in what you say. Um, I'm sorry, I'm getting tired. <laughs> um, so some of the implications that I found um, from this were that, um, oh, so the needs of the network always come first. Um, so what was the, I going to say the there? The needs of the network outweigh the needs of the few. Something like that. <laughs> that you really, again, like um, what I was saying before, you, you know, you work around the, um, those principles. Oh, I don't remember what I was going to say there. I'm sorry. Um, I'll probably remember later. So, and the other thing that um, I really see from it is that open source is the future and it's better in every way over proprietary software. And I think that um, companies need to start working around to find ways to incorporate open software instead of fighting it. Um, it's not something that's going away. It is a very strong community norm. And there's a reason for that, because it's almost always stronger, faster, better, and cheaper than producing proprietary software. It's more secure, um, as I'm sure many of you would agree, which you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe that. Um, the other thing that uh, I think is also important to note is that events like this are extremely important and that we need to work on getting more people to conferences because these social contacts that you make here are the things that are going to 
get you better jobs, that are going to allow you to do your job better um, because you're so interconnected. And the more that you reach out and the more communities that you reach out to, the different kinds of people you reach out to, the stronger your network is going to be and the better that you can do your job. Thank you for coming. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's my Twitter handle. Um, and uh, I'll open the floor to any questions that you have at this point. Thank you. All right, go ahead. Some of the institutions that you mentioned in your presentation yes. have recently become notorious for not following the community norms. Um, how do you provide an incentive for an organization that they don't feel they're connected to the community anymore, they don't feel they're part of it, how do you get them to come back into the fold and start behaving by our lights properly? You talk about the <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, no, but you can take your pick of I can, uh, I am, uh, Aaron, all of the above. Like what? What tools exist to? To, to modify the behavior of a large organization, well, not even not that large, but a, a corporation that is not following accepted behaviors. Get involved. Get involved, talk up, speak up, continue to speak up. Get other people involved. Like I said, these organizations are multi-stakeholder, and they, they're very proud of the fact that they come out of these traditions and out of academic traditions. If you keep appealing to that and do it consistently and keep reminding them of that this is, these are the important ideals in our community and you're not following them, you need to reach out more to us or you need to be doing this. And that's one way of approaching it. But I mean, that's not, that's not an easy answer. I mean, you know, I don't have godlike powers. I'll, oh, I'm, I'm, I, am a, I am a PhD, so. <laughs> But I don't, I don't have that much influence. But yeah, speak to the people, uh, approach the people who are, who are considered to be influential and find out how you can talk to them and communicate that, look, these are things that are really important and you're not working within the framework of the community. I think a lot of, um, See, this is one of the reasons I really wanted to talk about this issue is because you can't elaborate a problem without having the language for it or the concepts for it. And because there are a lot of people in IT who probably don't have quite so many social skills. Um, <laughs> this is a, diff no, it's, it's a difficult thing, but it's a learned thing. And I know because I have an autistic son, and he works super hard at that. Uh, but it is not, it's, it's an acquired skill. It does not come easily to him. But you have to keep working patiently. I mean, but if you can have language to communicate what the problem is, and in a way that makes sense to them, I think that you're going to have a better chance of making an impression and being able to bring about change. Apply for an Aaron Fellowship. They'll pay for you to go tell them they're doing it wrong. I have been an Aaron Fellow. <laughs> oh. And I subsequently spent 18 months trying to tell them what they were doing wrong, why they're alienating so many other customers, only to basically be told to shut up and go away. <laughs> so that was kind of discouraging. That, that's no kidding. True. Especially so? when it was a private email from a board member who explicitly told me in so many words to shut up and go away. It wasn't even implicit, it was explicit. Right, but again, the fact that that makes us angry yeah. illustrates that the aspiration of ones are being violated. And, and the sad thing is that yeah. Aaron is actually behaving fairly well compared to, say, I am. 
<laughs> which is yeah, which is not which is not incorrect. Yeah. It just yeah, I was spent eighteen months at that, and it's just like oh, now what do I do? Okay. Uh, can you give an example? Are they straying from their charter, or are they Aaron? leaning towards too much one demographic of their constituents, uh, or what? What, what? what are the problems? Aaron, Aaron suffers from, I would say, three primary problems. At least this is my opinion on the matter. One is they're extremely heavily biased. Actually, four. Number one is they're extremely heavily biased to their large corporate customers. Uh, they are blinded by their desire to get people off legacy contracts uh, to, the, like, to the exclusion of everything else. Uh, they are governed by fear. Fear primarily, primarily fear of liability. Every initiative that Aaron has started up in the last 10 years has been hedged with so many precautions and safeguards that it can't actually get anything done. Um, they ignore, to a large extent, not exclusively, but to a much to a fairly large extent, and, and this is partly just demographic based, they ignore their non-US constituencies. Uh, everything is focused around the US legal model, the US economic model, the US everything model, and there's no allowances for the fact that Caribbean countries and Canada aren't exactly the same. <laughs> and fourth, um, even superseding that they're driven by their large corporate and large academic clientele, they're driven by the will of one man. All right, thank you. Uh, I think that's possible. Or, or at least it allows them to more easily say, you know, well, Adam, you're, you're just any idiot on the street, so. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> you want to do the recording as well? Yeah. Um, I was saying just since they're throwing out the public, it might also make it easier in their minds to be able to say, well, Adam, you're just an idiot who came in off the street. What do you know? Mm -hmm. There might be some truth to that. But maybe part of that is you're getting comments from all sorts of people. Some people are going to have a better reputation than others. And that's part of the process, too. Right. So if the first time you ever speak up, you're attacking someone, maybe you're not going to pay as much attention. But if you're known in the community and you're, you know, 
you have well reasoned arguments and, and in general and you speak up, they're gonna you know you get paid more attention. Mm -hmm. It'll depend on the size of your beard. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, or how bright your hair is. <laughs> I'm just saying the whole process is organic. I mean, you, you can't pick one, you know, two parts and say, you know, it, it's like, you know, saying universal gravitation. You can't just say the Earth and the Moon. You know, there's everything else is involved too. You got to look at the whole picture. Mm -hmm. It just it strikes me as a political organization, not an IT type organization, because the people who are getting things done are the people who have. are the people who are very people skills focused, who have spent the past five years building contacts, not building technical credibility, and who now get in at the executive level of the organization and have some influence, even they have limited influence. Given how central they are to the, to the operation of the internet and the fact that the internet still continues to work, mm -hmm. are we routing around the damage? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so the process works. <laughs> So if Aaron continues to be less than useful, then other organizations are going to take up their slack. I mean, you know, maybe maybe Ripe will get more. But it's not something that, that, that Ripe could compete with right. by taking over responsibility. This is, this is a, a geographically specific monopoly by design. But they influence each other. I mean, the people who work in the organizations. I mean, you don't. You don't completely. They don't care. They don't care. And again, okay. They explicitly have said they don't care. The extent to which they communicate with each other is when blocks of IP addresses, for example, are assigned to one uh, registry or another. They, there, there are agreements that are made that are one-time things, but nothing uh, requires them to continue to, to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Aaron can operate with its own rules and its and, and completely independently of. Uh, of what Ripe does or what Ripe wants them to do. So it's more distributed, you'd say? A any, any sort of multi-regional issues will be discussed between Aaron and Ripe and maybe like all the others. But for anything that's solely within that region, it is 100% their responsibility and they're the only ones who have in, are allowed to have any sort of opinion on it. Interesting. Yeah. Now this is very specific to the RARs and the IP and uh, IP addresses and ISNs. Yeah, no, you're right. That's exactly the problem. It's not. It's a fiat uh, monopoly. Yeah. Right, but again, the fact that we're having this conversation and the fact that that makes people angry makes the point that they're violating a norm that we hold dear. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it, it absolutely makes the point. I mean, yeah, and I'll be honest. We had several very long conversations about institutions that were good examples. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, the fact that they violate these aspirational norms and the fact that that makes us angry illustrates the point that, yeah, this is, you know, and then, yeah, I mean, the question of what are you going to do about it is an incredibly hard one. <laughs> I would like to also mention that times when you see kind of failures within the communities is when one of these community norms is either absent or just completely disregarded. And um, being able is it, it's no, okay. uh, but being able to communicate with people who are in the policy making position, these kinds of things, like, look, you know, this is this is a deeply held belief within the community and you're not you're not addressing it you know you need to do something to address it because it's really upsetting people and it's not just you go ahead how far are they from charter violations or mission violations and are they public benefit organizations that might from in some optimistic level have to comply with what they state to the government that they are existing for um I wish I knew the answer to that question. Are they typically C3 organizations, C6s? Oh, um, I asked about that, that one time. Yes. And I have, and I actually found out the answer to that. It was like a totally unrelated uh, subject. It was actually came up at work. Um, well, but. 
double check it. Think about what. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's definitely an interesting avenue for further research, and yeah, I'd probably look There's into the that later. Section of open source and nonprofits, and we all hope that the IRS and the SWAT team will smash in if someone's violating the style line guidelines. And that doesn't really happen, but um, some of them will. I don't think they care that much. Really hope they'll stick to their like charter and their social contract. You name it. So all that information is available on the website. Yeah. Right now. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this room just pulled up? Under uh, <laughs> about us corporate documents. Okay. So thank you. Please enjoy. All right. Uh, okay. Very useful. Well, thank you. Ah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. The, we can be adjourned. Okay. All right. Well, we've got a little extra time if you guys want to go out early and find the snacks. I'm sure we're fine, unless my husband has a comment. Also, the OpenBSD Foundation is awesome. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that advertisement. <laughs>